Today's video is brought to you by 1440. So let me ask you something. How do you keep up with the news? Chances are you fall into one of three categories. You might get your news from social media, perhaps you spend too much time watching sensationalized cable news, or maybe you just don't pay attention to it at all. It's hard to figure out which of those is worse. These days, it's harder than ever to find a news source that will just deliver you the facts and leave the opinions at home. But fortunately, there's 1440, which wants to be your all-in-one source of impartial, quickly digestible news. It's easy to sign up for, and it's totally free. If you're someone who's pretty busy, I know I am, it can be hard to find the time in the day to dedicate to current events, but with 1440's easy news blurbs, you can get quick hits on the news in just a few minutes in the morning, over breakfast, or maybe just while you're taking the train to work, or however you get there. If you're in a rush, just stick to the primary news section, and maybe you've got a bit more time, you can wade into secondary categories like sports, business, science, stuff like that. Best of all, it's just the news. No clickbait, no spin. They just give you the facts and allow you to form your own opinion, which is nice. So get informed without all the BS today. Click the link in the description box or go to join1440.com forward slash megaprojects. That's join1440.com forward slash megaprojects and subscribe to 1440 for free today. And let's get into the video. Out of the darkness, the helicopters appeared. Their target, a large compound outside the Pakistani city, Ababotabad. Just 38 minutes after touching down, the helicopters once again took to the skies, but now with a dead body on board that signified the end of a nearly 15-year hunt for the man responsible for the largest terrorist attack in US history. If the final stages in the pursuit of Osama bin Laden had moved quickly, everything up to that point had progressed at a painfully slow speed and sometimes just not at all. The hunts for the leader of Al-Qaeda had become a source of continued frustration for just about everybody involved, but on the 2nd of May 2011, President Obama addressed the nation with the news that so many had craved. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. It's easy to simply connect Osama bin Laden with the attacks on the 11th of September 2001, but the truth was that he was already firmly nailed to the FBI's most wanted list by that point. His declaration of war against the United States in 1996 was preceded by the attack on the Gold Mihor Hotel in Aden in 1992, and followed by the 1998 attacks on the US embassies in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi, which killed over 200 people. As the new millennium dawned, he was linked with a series of attacks planned in Jordan that were eventually foiled by the Jordanian security services before they could be carried out, but any notion of success in the fight against Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda was to be short-lived. The suicide attack on the USS Cole on the 12th of October 2000 claimed the lives of 17 US Navy sailors, making it the worst attack on a US vessel since 1987 when the USS Stark was hit by two Iraqi Exocet missiles, killing 37 on board. Many of us will never forget where we were on the 11th of September 2001. I was in detention. The images of the planes hitting the World Trade Centers and the subsequent collapse are now seared into our public consciousness. After initially denying involvement, Bin Laden released a statement shortly after the attacks which read, What the United States is tasting today is nothing compared to what we have tasted for decades. Our Ummah has known this humiliation and contempt for over 80 years. Its sons are killed, its blood is spilled, its holy sites are attacked, and it is not governed according to Allah's command. Despite this, no one cares. It would be several years until he unequivocally took responsibility for the attacks, but suspicion fell on him and Al-Qaeda almost immediately. With no immediate claims of responsibility, all US authorities had to go on with the 19 hijackers. As the nation mourned, the full weight of the US government swung into gear, and it wasn't long until detailed profiles of the hijackers began to emerge. Fifteen of them were Saudi Arabian citizens, two of them from the United Arab Emirates, one was from Lebanon, and one was from Egypt. Communications intercepted on the day of the attack by both the NSA and the German intelligence agency appeared to point towards bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Telephone conversations and bank transactions 
transfer seemed to provide further evidence, and very quickly one man and one organization became the sole focus of the investigation. Now, we should probably mention at this point that this is a story that has, of course, become entangled in countless conspiracy theories. Some believe that the attacks on 9-11 were carried out by the US government. Others claim that bin Laden had nothing to do with it, and the US simply needed an available fall guy with a proven track record of terrorism. Believe me, we could go on, but we're just going to draw a line under that stuff because it would just detract from the hunt for Osama bin Laden. With American eyes now firmly fixed on the bearded face of bin Laden, their attention turned to his most likely whereabouts. Afghanistan. If you're a little rusty on Afghan history before 9-11, then let me quickly run you through a few things. Back in the 1970s, Afghanistan, in particular Kabul, then known as the Paris of Central Asia, was relatively liberal. Men and women socialized in public together, women were uncovered and often even sported fashionable miniskirts, while music, cinema, and alcohol were all part and parcel of everyday life. But this existence began to unravel after a bloodless coup in 1973, which saw the king abdicate his throne and the nation become a republic for the first time. This was followed by a much bloodier coup in 1978, the Soviet invasion in 1979, and the subsequent decade of hell for this tragic country with a long, proud history of fighting off would-be invaders. Even after the Soviets withdrew in 1989 with their tails firmly between their legs, it merely signaled the beginning of another stage as the country collapsed into civil war, spurred on by interference from various outside sources, namely Pakistan, Iran, and of course the United States, who had been supplying weapons to the Mujahideen throughout the Afghan-Soviet war. Somewhat ironically, money was also coming into the country to fund the same fighters from a man who had grown up within one of Saudi Arabia's richest families, the Bin Ladens. Yep, that's right, there was once a time when the USA and Osama bin Laden played for the same team. After moving back to Saudi Arabia after the end of the war with the Soviet Union, he was expelled from the country in 1991 after publicly denouncing the country's support for the United States during the first Gulf War. He then moved to Sudan before returning to Afghanistan in 1996. At this point, what had begun as a small group known as the Taliban had spawned into a sprawling movement that swept across the country. Their firebrand extremism caught on in a nation that had been plagued by corruption, murder, and tribal infighting. Taliban territory quickly grew and they took the capital, Kabul, on the 27th of September 1996. Almost immediately, two factions that had once fought each other now had united to form the Northern Alliance, a disjointed at best attempt at holding back the Taliban tide. And it was around this time that Osama bin Laden's influence in Afghanistan really grew. His 055 Brigade, formed in 1996 and made up of mercenaries from various Arab countries, was a guerrilla organization sponsored and trained by al-Qaeda to carry out mass killings as well as fighting alongside the more formal Taliban army. And that brings us back to the early stages of the hunt for Osama bin Laden. U.S. intelligence seemed certain that their man was hiding somewhere in Afghanistan under the protection of the Taliban regime. They asked them nicely if they wouldn't mind handing him over and closing the al-Qaeda bases spread throughout the country. But the Taliban rejected the proposal outright. In October 2001, the U.S. military was by far the most powerful anywhere on the planet. It may not have been the biggest in terms of physical numbers, but the level of technology available made picking a fight with the United States a suicidal proposition. When you add in the understandably vengeful rage following 9-11 and a quiet, unyielding anger. It was a fight that was only going to go one way and very quickly. Shortly before the war began and possibly foreseeing the carnage that was about to ensue, the Taliban made several covert offers to put bin Laden on trial either in Afghanistan, Pakistan, or possibly a third country once proof of his connection with 9-11 had been provided. These offers were rejected and by that stage preparations for what would go on to be the longest war in US history and cost roughly a trillion dollars in the process had been finalized. Operation Enduring Freedom commenced on the 7th of October 2001 as US and British warplanes began hitting Taliban and Al-Qaeda targets across Afghanistan. Special forces then combined with the Northern Alliance to surge across northern Afghanistan at a blistering pace. Kabul fell on the 13th of November 2001, just over a month after the attacks had begun, with most of the Taliban eventually slipping across the border into Pakistan. It had almost been too easy for the US and its allies, but the next 20 years would prove Afghanistan to be the scourge of the US military and the three presidents tasked with ending the conflict.
As planes and missiles began pulverizing Taliban targets, one area received far more attention than most. The frenzied assault on the mountainous Tora Bora region in eastern Afghanistan, close to the Pakistani border, signaled the first major attempt by U.S. forces to target bin Laden within the country. Intelligence suggested that bin Laden was now holed up inside a series of cave complexes in Tora Bora, effectively hemmed in with what they thought was a properly defended border behind it. The Battle of Tora Bora was a painstaking process, as small groups embedded within the Northern Alliance slowly pushed deeper into the mountains, with the area frequently being carpet bombed beforehand. When information emerged suggesting that the Al Qaeda leader was in a specific location, the shocking might of the United States came crashing down. The level of devastation was such that the landscape was forever altered, with most on the ground saying it was the most ferocious bombing campaign they'd ever experienced, as the US sent wave after wave of attacks. Things began to get a little murky in the first weeks of December. Whether it was down to bad intelligence, lack of commitment from higher up, or the newly signed ceasefire between the Northern Alliance and the Taliban, it's difficult to say. But it's clear that Osama bin Laden was able to leave Tora Bora and enter Pakistan on the 12th or 13th of December, or sometime in January, according to some sources. The United States had allowed their most wanted man to slip through their fingers, and it would be 10 years until they got the next shot. It is, of course, difficult to be completely sure about Bin Laden's movements over the coming years, but some patchy details suggested that he and his family moved regularly and stayed in a series of safe houses in 2002 before renting some accommodation in the Shangla district in the Swat Valley, then Harapur, a small town close to Islamabad, before finally moving to Abbottabad in June of 2005. After Bin Laden's escape into Pakistan, the hunt turned cold, lingering suspicions that he was being protected by at least some elements inside the Pakistani government eventually proved to be true, but with the US being stonewalled and certainly unwilling to enter Pakistan to find him themselves, there was little that could be done. After failing to capture bin Laden, the US soon instigated another war with the attacks in Iraq beginning in March 2003 under the uh, pretense of weapons of mass destruction being there. They weren't. After smashing Iraq apart, President Bush stood on the deck of the USS Abraham Lincoln and made the famous mission accomplished statement. The United States and our allies have prevailed. Which now sounds as shaky as Nixon proclaiming that he wasn't a crook. The hard truth was that the US had found neither weapons of mass destruction nor Osama bin Laden. These two conflicts would drag on for years to come, costing trillions and nearly 10,000 US lives. The long road to the eventual killing of Osama bin Laden began with information from a suspect at Guantanamo Bay, which led to the identification of one of his couriers, known as Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, who was eventually tracked to a location in Abbottabad. In 2010, he was followed to a large compound on the outskirts of the city, a compound eight times the size of your typical house in the area, with high walls topped with barbed wire and residents inside who never left and who chose to burn all of their rubbish. Satellite images were inconclusive but there was a growing sense that they may have found their man. However, options were still horribly limited. They could, of course, drop a bomb that would completely level the compounds, but how would you explain that to a Pakistani government who you were formerly allied with and who was receiving millions in USA to fight extremism? And what if it turned out to simply be a rich reclusive family? Another option was a raid involving special forces, but this too came with plenty of drawbacks and would certainly require positive identification before being sanctioned. With a devious plan that only the CIA could devise, a local doctor set up a fake polio vaccine program and visited the compound under the guise of vaccinating the children present, but also extracting DNA that could then be compared to that of Bin Laden's sister, who had died in the US in 2010. Now, the ethics of this have been debated ever since, especially considering this episode had a debilitating effect on Pakistan's drive to eliminate polio. It's not even entirely clear whether a DNA match was found, as the US government has remained relatively tight-lipped on the matter. But for whatever reason, the degree of certainty over the mystery resident's identity, who came to be known as the Pacer, gradually increased, and one of the most audacious raids in US military history was set in motion.
As I mentioned, this would be a raid with countless unknowns and moving pieces. You needed only to go back 18 years to the chaos of Mogadishu and the famous Black Hawk Down incident to see just how easily a simple operation like this could go so drastically wrong. A targeted missile attack was out of the question, so the responsibility would fall to SEAL Team 6. President Obama formally authorized the operation and intense training began using a replica compound. The mission to fly in 25 Navy SEALs aboard helicopters who would then storm the compound and kill Bin Laden got its final approval on the 1st of May. In the early hours of the 2nd of May, two modified Black Hawk helicopters crept through the darkness as Operation Neptune's Spear began. Two Chinook helicopters stuffed with commandos waited a short distance off, ready to assist in case the SEALs needed to fight their way out. The Black Hawks used hilly terrain and nap of the earth techniques, a low altitude flight course to stay off Pakistani radar as they approached the compound. Things went wrong almost immediately as one of the Black Hawks experienced a hazardous airflow condition known as a vortex ring state, which resulted in one of its rotors clipping the compound wall and the helicopter crash landing. Miraculously, there were no significant injuries as the SEALs piled out into the compound. The other helicopter had landed safely just outside the compound, with its occupants soon scaling the walls. There are many conflicting reports of exactly how things played out from here. Certain SEALs have since come forward to declare that they were the one to kill Osama bin Laden, but there's no conclusive story. The compounds was pitch black as the SEALs entered, and they quickly dispatched four people. Three men and a woman, some who seemed to be armed and some not. Other people in the compounds that the SEALs came into contact with had their hands zip-tied before being moved outside of the building. As the SEALs climbed the stairs, Osama bin Laden knew that his time was up. There are reports that he tried to hide behind a female relative and was shot in the process, or alternatively, he was shot while peering out of the room as the stampeding SEALs approached. However it happened, the most wanted man in the world was killed just 15 minutes after the raid began, and the code words that had been assigned to this exact moment was finally heard over the radio. Geronimo. Bin Laden's body was placed in a body bag and taken outside to a waiting helicopter, while the SEALs scoured the compound for additional intelligence, which included 470,000 computer files discovered on 183 separate devices. The damaged helicopter was then destroyed as a replacement arrived to ferry out SEAL Team 6 and the body of the man that the US had been searching for for over 15 years. Just 38 minutes after one of the most potentially damaging and embarrassing US military options in history began, it was all over. It's difficult to see how Operation Neptune's Spear had been anything but an unbridled success. Osama bin Laden's body was formally identified shortly after and buried at sea within the 24-hour window stipulated by the Islamic faith. On the evening of the 2nd of May 2011, rumors began to circulate the globe that bin Laden had been killed, and not long after, President Obama addressed the nation to confirm the news. This was followed by celebrations around the country. Groups gathered outside the White House, baseball games were interrupted as the news broke live. Joy is probably the wrong word to use, but a profound sense of relief was clear. The hunt for Osama bin Laden had gone on for so long, many simply assumed that it was now a lost cause. In the subsequent days, months, and even years, the tremors emanating from the raid spread. Pakistan cried foul, as you could probably imagine, but when it became clear that bin Laden had been living comfortably inside Pakistani borders for many years and almost certainly had plenty of assistance in doing so, things quietened down pretty quickly. Then there was the legality of what had happened and whether he could have been taken alive to stand trial in the US. Considering that Guantanamo Bay remains a stain that the US just can't remove, it's difficult to imagine a system where bin Laden would have faced his day in court on US soil. It sounds bad to even say it, but killing Osama bin Laden and throwing his body over the side of a ship with 140 kilograms worth of iron chains wrapped around it was seen as by far the quickest and easiest solution. A show trial would have been great for the media, but would have probably provided years worth of headaches in the process, during which his figure as a martyr would have no doubt grown exponentially. The hunt for Osama bin Laden began back in the mid-1990s, with his dark shadow eventually growing to become the most despised and hated person in recent US history. His continued freedom removed a scab that just wouldn't heal. The idea of revenge now feels a little outdated, but let's be honest. There was plenty of that. In the early days of the war, there was even talk of bringing bin Laden's head back to the US. Whether that was entirely true or simply some hyperbole, we can't be sure. But it gives us an idea of the merciless pursuit of the man responsible for 9-11. The mega-terrorist who delivered the most painful blow the United States had ever experienced was dead. When it comes to a rabid, vengeful US intelligence chase, you can run, you can hide, but eventually, they'll find you. But the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda.
So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.